Hello everybody, and welcome to another short and late and chill audiobook stream. Hope everybody's week is off to a good start. I'm sorry I didn't start sooner, but work was long, but also weirdly demoralizing. If I explain to you guys some of the nuances of the place I work, you wouldn't believe me. You would say I was being satirical and outlandish. Or maybe I'm just in a bad mood today, who knows. So I figured I should at least not cancel my stream and try and convince myself I am being productive with my life. It'll be a short stream, though. Try to keep these two an hour, especially since I think worry as it gets later and goes on longer. The, the, I don't know, my voice isn't as clear, or my mind isn't as clear. <laughs> but it's also weird sometimes when I read these books on stream, I end up with streamer brain, and I try and remember last time or what I what I read last time. I'm like, uh. Well, there was this character and this character, and I think they were talking about something. Of course, to be fair, mysteries from the teens tend to be a little more complicated than, you know, your average novel. They chuck a lot of stuff in there. Hmm. <laughs> but thank you to everybody who came out to my last couple of streams. Um, Sunday, we played more of... Carol Reed, Hope Springs Eternal, another mystery. We're close to finishing. And on Saturday, we played Haunted PS1 Demo Disc 2021, which was fun and weird, and which we're also close to finishing. Oh, I'm like, I'm sort of an office assistant at a pr production company that also does some a little bit of development, I guess you'd say. I, I don't know. It's it's hard to describe it. Let's say I work in the film and TV industry, and it is therefore bonkers. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Some days are weirder than others. Hmm. <laughs> so tonight we're going to read the second installment of. Crater's Gold by Philip Curtis, first published in 1919. And thinking of chapters 5 through 8, if I get tired, maybe it'll be 5 through 7. One chapter per stream, how's that sound? <laughs> I know. <sighs> That'd be a nightmare. Or then edit it into a, yeah, one continuous audio file and then upload it to LibriVox. Which I keep saying I'm going to do one fine day. <laughs> and then I have a backlog of, what is this, my fourth one? Fourth audiobook? <laughs> but then I say I'm going to do a lot of things. Mm. And as a reminder, I will be... Have... You know, I'll have speech chat turned off and raids disabled. And I won't be responding to chat until the end, the end when I'll catch up. Mm. 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 Chapter Five. The footsteps proved on investigation to be those of the deaf and antique housekeeper, Mrs. Fields, looking very peaked and very unpleasant in a flannel wrapper. But why should she choose one o'clock in the morning to be nosing around a cold attic was a thing of which Styles demanded, and obtained, an explanation. It was an affair of an extra quilt, an adventure on which it would be impossible to cast any discredit. 
On the contrary, Styles commended her, to deaf ears, for the first wholly sane conversation to which he had listened that day. But he had to admit that, in spite of himself, she had given him an uncomfortable moment. The sleeping rooms of the old house were in far better shape than the living rooms, for it was in their bedrooms that old country families did themselves proud. Stiles had a bedroom which approached the regal, no common affair of whitewashed plaster and plated rag rugs. It was a heavy spot in which the one plane above the neighbor's idea had really come into its own. He had gone to sleep mocking himself for ever entertaining the idea that he ought to have a gun and had awakened to hear footsteps. The affair had had one pleasing feature for Stiles, in that it had proved that he did really have some physical bravery, a quality which he had previously neither doubted nor boasted, merely one to which he had never given much thought. It had simply been a matter of making sure that he really heard footsteps and not a loose shutter, and then he had found himself on his feet, with wit even, to remark that the floor was cold. He discovered, to his interest, being now, in a way, tied up with the mystery business, that he searched the whole first floor with a perfect calm, which increased, on the second floor, to a certain sporting zest, and, on the third, to downright eagerness. When he reached the attic to hear unmistakable sounds, and even to see a strange humping shape, he found that he recognized instinctively that the sounds were friendly, and the shape, although not identified, yet something wholly legal. He had, of course, some start when he called and received no answer. Then, realizing that Mrs. Fields was deaf, he went up and put a hand on the shape, supposing that it must be she, as it was, quilt and all. A feature of it that occurred to Stiles afterwards was that Mrs. Fields had not been startled at all. Either there was something very corsair in her nature, or long years of housekeeping in windy houses had made her blunt to surprise. She merely put the quilt which furnished her alibi over her arm, walked down the stairs ahead of him, and said good night at the door of her room in a manner which had a dash of the debonair in it. As a rough outline for a scene it had elements, but just the same, in the morning Styles could not resist the temptation to see whether anything really had been done to his desk by Mrs. Fields or by anyone else. To date, nothing had, but, as afternoon rolled around, Stiles surmised that it might be just as well to go out and look over his hundred acres, for up to that time he had taken them largely on faith, merely basked in the majesty of their possession. If there really were any oil wells or gold mines about, he would know just what to say to the next caller. He also took the precaution of leaving a brisk businessman's notice with the housekeeper. Mrs. Fields, if any millionaires or such like come at along to buy the place, don't make a deal until I return. Then, of course, he had to shout the revised version, If any one comes while I am gone, just ask them to wait. If they can't wait, tell them to leave their money in the big jar beside the clock. Not on the study floor. "'Like the last gentleman?' asked Mrs. Fields, grimly. "'Bully for you, Fieldsy!' exclaimed Stiles, but not within range of her oral powers, limited as they were. As might be supposed, few oil fields were found by the young master of the old crater place. His hundred acres, he discovered, ran heavily to sandbank. On every excuse— the sand jutted out from the dry brown grass of the upland pastures, the only relief being crooked grey fences which divided one field from another. In vain Stiles searched for seepings of oil under rocks, or for colour of gold in the gravel of the one little brook which ran through the place. The only part of the estate which really came up to his eye was a green little marsh through which the brook ran, and a small plantation of birches which surrounded the house. Crashing his way out from the underbrush of the ladder, he entered the house through the kitchen to be met by Mrs. Fields with an excited smile and a clean apron, the true barometer of alien presence. 
They've come, she whispered. Who've come? The people to buy the place. Stiles searched her countenance, but there was no trace of guile. She really meant it, and Stiles was excited. From the form of her words, he foresaw a purchasing party in force. Hitherto he had talked only to individuals. Like as not, he might find a corporation assembled, gavel and all. His study, in fact, did at first glance give the appearance of being densely populated, a sort of afternoon tea effect, which the impression, which impression resulted probably from the fact that of the tea, two people who actually were waiting in the shabby little room, both were extremely well dressed, and one was a woman. A slender and amiable young man in a grey checked suit rose at Stiles's entrance, with a pleasant smile, a frank, winning smile. He was red-haired and rather Celtic in face. Mr. Stiles, he said, I don't know whether you know me. My name is Exberger. This is Miss Fuller. The young woman, in a garden hat and a limp silk sweater, nodded to him good-humouredly from the rattan rocking chair in which she was installed. She had very large, very dark eyes and a wistful smile, but, while good-natured, the world had not much left to tell her. For the minute, however, Stiles was busy trying to believe that this really was Charles Exberger. Curious that he had lived in New York for fifteen years, picturing this man as a fat, gross creature with a white waistcoat and tilted cigars. Exberger, meanwhile, stood watching Stiles with an easy, amused expression, which Miss Fuller reflected. "'I have often heard of you,' said the theatrical man. "'You wrote the account in The Sun, did you not, when the Hippodrome elephants went on a hunger strike? I was speaking of you just the other day to Baumgarten.' Stiles was surprised and looked it. "'He said you were, but I thought he was lying.' "'You would, wouldn't you?' agreed Exberger, pleasantly. There came a long pause, but the most amiable kind of pause, and Exberger did not so much break it as end it. You don't mind if I ask, do you, if you still have Baumgarten's money? Did you tell him about it? asked Stiles. To tell the truth, I didn't, confessed the young man. It would have been a pity just yet. And that's lucky, too, confessed Stiles, because, just after I wrote you, I found that Baumgarten himself did not drop the money, but the local real estate man. It seems that Baumgarten had left it with him. Then Stuffy, that's what we call him, exclaimed Miss Fuller, coming into the conversation for the first time, although she'd been quite satisfactory a part of the mise-en-scene. Then Stuffy doesn't know that it was lost at all, asked Exberger. He's still got that coming to him. He has, if anyone chooses to tell him. Better and better, laughed Exberger. I'll tell him myself. He turned to Miss Fuller. Don't you get it? Stuffy running around sweating blood when he learns that a hick real estate agent lost all that money? He turned back to Stiles quickly. You said that it was a lot of money, didn't you? Ten thousand dollars, replied Stiles. Rich, shouted Exberger. Rich! He mused a moment, then looked at Stiles shrewdly. Baumgarten, Baumgarten wanted to buy your place, didn't he? Stiles rather hesitated. Yes, he did, he confessed. He felt that he ought not to confess it, but this nice young man had a way of carrying him with him. But the funny part of it was, he explained, that when Puller, that's the agent, nice boy too, lost Baumgarten's money, he had come up here, not in Baumgarten's interest, but in his own, or rather for other parties, people. He wanted to buy it, too, asked Exberger quizzically. For the first time, his face had lost that genial smile. Yes, I've had several offers for the place, replied Stiles. He felt justified in including his uncle's best friend. Lately, asked Exberger, since Baumgarten. Well, what do you know about that, asked Exberger. As usual, he turned to Miss Fuller for audience. Stiles watched the smile slowly die on the young man's face. Five minutes, perhaps, at the most, had elapsed since he had come into the room, yet he felt as if they had all been laughing at jokes in common for years. He realized that if these people had any ulterior motives, 
he would be as clay in such pleasant hands. "'By any chance, do you want to buy the place yourself?' he asked mildly. "'Me?' asked Exberger, surprised. He blinked his eyes nervous, nervously. Then, as if the thought had never occurred to him before, but as if he now found it not uninviting, he added, "'I don't know. Why?' Because, explained Stiles, if you don't, you are the first man who has come here who hasn't. Exberger blinked his eyes still more, then changed to a quieter tone. Do you mind telling me just what really did happen? Of course I know that Baumgarten came tumbling up here and made you violent cash offers. He always shouts cash, always waves cash. What then? You don't mind? Not at all, replied Stiles. And he really didn't mind, although he wondered vaguely if he ought to mind, if he were losing a million or so by not minding. But first, he said, will you tell me who Baumgarten is? Oh, Baumgarten's a damn fool, replied Exberger. That seemed to cover it, and Stiles picked up the thread of his narrative. Well, Mr. Baumgarten appeared one day and tried to get me to sell the place, but, as it happened, I didn't want to sell. He tried to get me to set a price, any price, and went away very unhappy because I wouldn't. He had always already been to see Puller, but apparently thought he could do this business better himself. He would, said Miss Fuller. So then, explained Stiles, Puller himself came round and learned what had happened. That evening he came again, but this time, it appears, he was not acting for Baumgarten, but for a person or persons unknown. Local talent, presumably. Exberger looked at Miss Fuller. What did I tell you? He cried triumphantly. Miss Fuller nodded, but a bit impatiently. Her dark eyes were all for the rest of the story. So that, Stiles explained, was the time I found it was he who had dropped the money. But, in the meantime, I had written to you, supposing that Baumgarten had dropped it himself. But why to me? asked Exberger quickly. Oh, yes, yes. He had told you that I had spoken of you, and you thought he was lying. He left me under that impression, explained Stiles, that when you and he were not in each other's company, it was an empty day for you both. Exberger looked at Miss Fuller, and they both smiled. That's stuffy all over, said the former. Did he also let you know how close he was to Claw and Erlanger and David Belasco? No, confessed Stiles. He seemed to think that you would make the biggest impression on my rural mind. "'And how does the matter stand now?' asked Exberger. "'It stands, stands just where it stood before,' replied Stiles. "'Baumgarten wants to buy the classic old ruin. "'Puller wants to buy it for persons unknown. "'And an old friend of my uncle's, who look, looks like Washington Irving "'and talks like the villain in Way Down East, "'is putting in a cautious feeler or two on his own behalf. "'And I forgot to say,' added Stiles, that everyone concerned, Baumgarten, Puller, and Washington Irving, all go into convulsions every time I mention your name. And raise their bids, suggested Exberger. Each according to the manner of his kind, acknowledged Stiles. Baumgarten talks about raising the ante, blind. Puller urges me to keep the pro property in local hands, and Washington Irving warns me against your soft city ways. Exberger had taken a seat in the worst of the chairs, and at this he lay back and roared, slapping his knee. "'Better, and better, and better!' he laughed. "'And you,' he added suddenly, "'haven't an idea what the whole thing is about.' "'No,' Stiles confessed. "'I haven't the slightest idea.' He had not meant to confess it at all, but under Exberger's clear eye had done it before he could stop himself. "'Of course,' he added, to save his sophistication, there are already rumors, I suppose, that there is oil on the land, or gold, or both. Of course, agreed Exberger, soberly. He sat, thinking, as if uncertain where to begin, and then he added, slowly, Well, the long and painful story is just this and no more. He paused suddenly and remarked, Of course there is the possibility that I may be lying to you myself. I have still got the place replied Stiles, grimly. Miss Fuller threw him an appreciative glance. Exberger laughed. Anyway, this is what happened. Three or four days ago, we were motoring through here, Miss Fuller and I, 
and I noticed this place and wondered about it. it looked as if some old country squire li had lived here some time. Just wondered, that's all. Then we went to the village and stopped for lunch. White House. Know it? Place with welcome mat on the mat? That's the place, replied Exberger, almost in tears because you tried to spend some money there. They had another guest, too. All of one. Cigar drummer or something of the sort. Knew me by sight. Pointed me out to the local youth. Know who that is? That's Charles Exberger. Owns all the moving pictures. You could see him gather in ones and twos. Then, I suppose, my chauffeur threw out his chest at a, a little in the garage. He's got to have some compensation for holding a hard job. Then, of course, one or two village cut-ups strolled up to me. Nice day, Mr. Axberger, and all that. How do you find the roads? You know the stuff. So, just to make talk, I asked one man. I've forgotten who. It might have been your friend the real estate man. I asked who owned the old yellow place with the cupola. They told me the owner had just died and the place was on the market, and I said, You don't tell me. How much do they want for it? What else could I say? Then I added, Fine place, or something like that. And then they said it had belonged now to a man named Stiles, reporter in New York. And so I said, Not Andy Stiles, just as if you and I were bosom pals. My old friend Andy Stiles, I says. Then I thought I'd string him a bit. What's it worth? I says. Possibilities in that place. Do you get me now? I think I begin to, replied Stiles. But where does Baumgarten come in? I'm getting to him, answered Exberger. But before we were one mile out of town, I said to Miss Fuller, didn't I, Rose? I said, I'll bet that already that already it has spread all over town that I've got my eye on that place to make moving pictures. Next thing, I'll be hearing from real estate agents. It wasn't mind reading. It happens every time I ask my way around a small town. But I never thought it would be as good as this. But Baumgarten, hinted Stiles. Oh, yes, Baumgarten. Say, do you know what is the ambition of every Jew who makes money in New York? I'm a Jew myself, he added, by way of aside. Not really, interrupted Miss Fuller. Exberger smiled. That wasn't necessary, was it? Every Jew who makes money in the clothing business. Then I was right, interposed Stiles. That's what I guessed. Did you really? asked Exberger, interested. It wasn't hard, suggested Miss Fuller, dryly. As it happens in this case, continued Axberger, it is art novelties, but they are all the same. Baumgarten's one dream is to be a theatrical man, wants to be pointed out in cafes. And not just at country hotels, remarked Miss Fuller, sweetly. Exberger flushed. <laughs> have mercy, Rose, have mercy. Anyway, Baumgarten has been making my life a burden. Charlie this and Charlie that, until that night, after we got back to the city, I was thinking of how the Hicks had tumbled, so I said to myself, I bet this wise guy is just as big as Hick as they are. Sam, I says to him, he's got a good name for the show business, suggested Stiles. Exberger looked up quickly. I'll tell you something about that some time, he remarked. Sam, I says, I saw something good up in the country today. Fine old place, badly run down, but it's simply a gem. Then I told him just where it was and said, And who do you suppose owns it? Andy Stiles. You know Andy, of course. Just snapped it up. Don't know what he means to do with it, I says, looking all the time as if I did. But he's a wise bird, that boy is. Have you ever noticed that in the show business it is part of the game to know everybody and know them by their first name? Now, what do you think that rascal's up to? I asked Stuffy. Sheer rot, explained Exberger. But you've got to do it in show business. They're all half crazy. What you've got to do in show biz, they're all half crazy, is to nod your head and talk to them in a half whisper. And tap their knee from time to time, suggested Stiles. Yes, agreed Exberger, and give the impression, now this is just between you and I, there's not many people that know it, but this is straight stuff, inside dope. It wouldn't matter if you told them that the Kaiser had opened a foundling's home. Anything will do. 
just so you say it in a husky voice and nod your head and tap their knee. That's a good line, by the way. So that, so that, in brief, explained Dexberger, is what I did to old Stuffy. I was very careful to say that I didn't want the place myself. I said to Rose afterwards, and didn't I, Rose? I said, I bet that old slob will run up to Eden, or whatever they call it, and want to buy the place ahead of me. By the way, when did he come? Yesterday, reckoned Stiles, surprised himself to realize that it had been so recently. Hexberger slapped his knee again and turned to Miss Fuller. Can you beat it? he asked. So there you are, he concluded to Stiles triumphantly. There you have the whole business. Baumgarten wanting it because he thinks I want it, and your agent chap wanting it because he thinks that both of us want it, and all the hicks wanting it because they think the three of us want it. It's a yell, that's what it is. He positively beamed at Stiles, as if he had done him the favor of his, his life in exploding his bubble, and not until that moment had Stiles realized that he had not. Then it came to him ruefully. And here I was, spending the money already. Exberger's face completely sobered. He was a great boy, after all, and he had a great boy's amazing sympathy. My dear fellow, he exclaimed, you should worry. You don't think I'm going to spoil the farce, do you? Keep em coming. Let em bid, and then let it go to the best of them. I only hope that it's Baumgarten that gets stung. Say, he continued, with a sort of feverish enthusiasm, don't you know that every man, woman, and child in town will know that I've been here ten minutes after I'm gone? Yes, replied Stiles slowly. It was really funny that, although he had been the skeptic of skeptics about his own gold mine, yet, now that someone had agreed with him that it was only pyrites, he was almost tearful. To tell the truth, this is just about what I supposed had happened, but everyone was so mysterious that I looked forward to the missing papers and the shots in the night. And the old squire's daughter? asked Miss Fuller. I hadn't got to her yet, but she was about due, answered Stiles. And now look at this dumb reality. At that very moment, a chauffeur's cap appeared in the doorway. Mr. Exberger, the car's gone. Gone? Gone where? exclaimed Exberger. Gone, insisted the man wildly, talking so fast he chattered. I only left it a minute to go to the back door for a drink of water, and now I come back and it's gone. It's stolen. Chapter 6 The big foreign car was gone, right enough, but Exberger ought to have known, and Stiles ought to have known, and most of all, the chauffeur ought to have known, that the car could hardly have been stolen without starting the engine, and that the engine would hardly have been started without rousing someone in the house fifty feet away. When one's own ten-thousand-dollar car is gone, however, one does not think as logically as that. The natural picture conjured up was one of thieves in organized bands reporting to some head thief in New York. Under this delusion, or one like it, Exberger was running around crying to be led to a telephone, and Stiles was explaining frantically that none existed, when Mrs. Fields came in with the, the bland announcement, A gentleman's car is at the bottom of the hill. Bottom of the hill? roared Exberger. Who took it there? Mrs. Fields looked at him, puzzled. Took it, she replied blankly. No one took it. It went by itself. Am I crazy, or who is? demanded Exberger, and Stiles himself stared. It began to dawn on him that, in the person of Mrs. Fields, he was housing what might be called a parochial mind. Sandy hillsides that contained oil untapped and motor cars that lounged off by themselves were apparently not spectacular to her. He wondered what would be. He knew an unexpected visitor during her ironing hour. Investigations proved, however, that Mrs. Fields had stated a simple fact. The car was indeed at the foot of the hill, but Mrs. Fields had neglected to add that it was also in the ditch, astride the brook, and upside down. Those facts had possibly not seemed to her of any importance, or perhaps, becoming bored, she had not waited to see that part of the performance. Yet there they found the beautiful foreign colossus, its four wheels in the air, its belly to the blue, looking uncomfortably nude and crab-like. Just what had happened it was only possible to guess, for Mrs. Fields had been the only witness, and her story, although unimpeachable, 
was valuable for little except its color. She had been hanging out clothes at the side of the house, stable cloths to be exact, when she chanced to look up and saw the big empty car rolling solemnly away down the hill. As nearly as one could gather, she had stood and watched it without even much curiosity. It must have been quite a picture, the gaunt, wind-blown old woman and the big empty car, both non-committal, and each, as it were, with a sardonic grin. The supposition was that the brakes had not been properly set. The chauffeur advanced the theory that they had been tampered with, but the only certain fact was that the car was now in the brook, exciting comment among the frogs and the tadpoles. A rural delivery driver came along as the four of them stood looking down at the wreck. Presumably, he asked whether there had been an accident, for Stiles heard the chauffeur retort, Oh no, we did it on purpose. After that, it took the promise of considerable capital and the most flattering attitudes on the part of Miss Fuller to appease the delivery man and persuade him to carry the good news to Ghent. Half an hour later appeared two swart fellows from the local garage to shake their heads pessimistically and give it as their opinion that nothing short of a crane would pull the car on its feet. A crane was not to be had short of Felstead, but they left with the promise to bring it the following morning. The chauffeur began listlessly to salvage the cushions, and Stiles suggested that he be left alone with his grief. Chapter 7 Rather stimulated by the excitement of entertaining his first guests, Stiles dressed for dinner somewhat more elaborately than usual, and hurried down to the unpainted piazza. But Miss Fuller was there before him. Of baggage she had, of course, none, but she had done marvels with what she carried in her handbag, or rather what Exberger carried in his pockets for her. As they had gone to their rooms, Stiles had heard fundamentals of beauty culture frankly demanded, and had seen them delivered. Throughout the whole excitement, Miss Fuller had remained a silent and unmoved spectator. Stiles had imagined that few things of this life could move Miss Fuller, but now she displayed more animation. She greeted her host with a friendly smile, and he walked across to her side. "'I presume,' she remarked, without preliminaries, "'that you're rather curious to know just why Char Charlie Exberger and I are travelling around together.' Stiles had not thought of it at all. "'Am I expected to be curious?' he asked. Miss Fuller laughed, but she looked at him with a quick and appreciative expression. "'Not unless you want to be,' she replied. "'But people usually are.' She proceeded to stare, to state the case in what probably seemed to her a nutshell. We are not married, and we are not engaged. I may add that we did not expect to be shipwrecked for a day or two. Does that explain, explain matters? Perfectly, replied Stiles. But apparently it did not, for Miss Fuller was still a bit meditative. I suppose it looks funny, she said, a little apprehensively. My dear lady, exclaimed Stiles, there are no trains to-night, and Mr. Exberger cannot leave the car. What else could you do? But Miss Fuller was wistful. I don't know, she said slowly. Suppose someone should hear of it. Stiles looked at her curiously, and with perhaps a little more than curiosity. It was odd to see this girl, who looked as if she might tap one on the shoulder and say, I'm wise, kid, I'm wise, become wistful about the properties, about the proprieties. After all, he reassured her, there is always Mrs. Fields. I am sure it's all right. What is all right? asked Exberger, coming at that moment out the front door. He was looking at something that he carried in his hands and spoke absently. I was telling Mr. Stiles, explained Miss Fuller, that we were not married or anything. Were you? answered Exberger. What did you tell him that for? There is something Turkish about theatrical magnates. They speak tersely to their women. Then, as if the only subject that interested him were the object that he carried in his hands, he burst out, Will you tell me what the devil this is? He held in his hand a sheet of paper, yellow with age, but still robust with the quality of the days when paper was paper. At his query, Miss Fuller crowded up to his shoulder, and Stiles looked on from behind her. Exberger read, like a little boy in the primer class, for the writing was shaky and faint. This 
in ye year of our Lord, ye one thousand seven hundred and ninety-first, and in ye year of this republic, ye fifteen... I suppose he means the fifteenth, suggested Axberger. Say, this is ancient. This, uh, this year stuff. <laughs> Do you know that's what they used to say for thee? You don't say, Charlie, replied Miss Fuller sarcastically. You don't say. I was just telling you, that's all, retorted Exberger. That's the way it is written on Shakespeare's tomb. Suppose you give us a little more of this strange tale, suggested Miss Fuller, and Exberger, without rancor, went on reading slowly. Hmm. <laughs> From dust man was formed, and to dust he returneth. Why tea treasure? Why tea treasure? said Exberger, looking up. What the deuce is why tea? That, suggested Stiles, uh, on the principle of ye for thee? By George, I believe he's right, exclaimed Exberger excitedly. The thrill of the antiquarian was already on him. Yat treasure, which man amasseth unto himself in this earth, I wonder why he didn't say yes, earth, if he says ye and yat. Who is he? asked Miss Fuller languidly. Well, let me find out, can't you? replied Exberger, now lost in his studies. Oh, pardon me, pardon me, pleaded Miss Fuller hastily. Where did you get this quaint conceit? I found it under my bed. Do you always look under the bed when you find yourself in a strange room? Oh, for the love of Mike, Rose, protested Exberger. It wasn't really under the bed. It was sort of under the bed. He continued with his paleography. Yet treasure which man amasseth unto himself in this earth, he shall leave in ye... Uh, there he goes again. He shall leave in ye earth, and now I, Nicholas Caton... Uh, no, it's Nicholas Crater... Now I, Nicholas Crater, being humbled and oppressed with a sense of wrongdoing, do leave in this earth, see, he says this every time, that must be the way they did, do leave in this earth yet treasure which I have amassed thereon. But as by mine own toil was yet treasure amassed, so now yet I have returned it to ye earth, let him who will digger for it, in ye earth, even as I have done. Signed this day, Nicholas Crater. Ye... S ye son, ye same being in sound body and mind. Exberger looked at his host, and his eyes lit with excitement. Say, he exclaimed, do you know what I think this is? No, Mr. Bones, answered Miss Fuller, what do you think yet is? Oh, cut it out, Rose, pleaded Exberger. I bet this is an old manuscript. No, breathed Rose incredulously, but Exberger paid no attention to her. Then his natural metropolitan suspicion of everything in heaven and earth slowly came back. He looked at Stiles doubtfully. Do you really believe that there can be something valuable hidden around this place? Unfortunately, replied Stiles, I don't. Exberger looked at him, puzzled. Then, reluctantly, he looked at the yellowed paper. But who was this gink, this Nicholas Crater? He wouldn't have written like that if he hadn't meant something by it, would he? Probably not, replied Stiles. If there ever had been any such man, but unhappily there wasn't. Nicholas Crater, I am sorry to say, exists only in my own imagination, of that antique document, the author stands before you. You? You wrote it? gasped Exberger, about as crestfallen as Stiles had been at the exposure of the afternoon. But what for? Well, confessed Stiles, with Baumgarten and Puller and all the rest of them playing Treasure Island and East Lynn all over the place, I thought I would give them something that would really keep them busy. So in a dull moment, I composed this pretty forgery and left it around where any enterprising prior might run across it. If you found it in your room, among the sheets and pillowcases, I gather that some little prior must have done just that thing. 
But Exberger looked unconvinced. But, man, he argued, it's old. The paper's old. The ink is old. Everything is old in this house, replied Stiles, and thin and wan and pale, not to mention eldritch and eerie. The paper is old because, naturally, one does not put old wine in new bottles. I tore it from a book, an old book, to wit, Good Holmes' Domestic Encyclopedias of Practical Information, an amazing volume which fitted my ancestors to cope with an, any emergency from angel cake to childbirth and fire balloons. I have spent hours with it, fascinated. This was a blank page intended for additional receipts and memoranda. He paused, smiling, but Exberger still appeared unconvinced, while Miss Fuller, standing between them, looked first at one and then at the other. "'Will you please tell me,' she asked at last, "'just who's stringing who?' "'And I can show you the book,' protested Stiles, mildly. He went to his study and returned with a volume which was large enough, at least, to cover the ground he had mentioned. At the back he showed a rough edge where a page had been torn out, and into which the edge of the antique document fitted perfectly. "'Well, I'm a sucker,' confessed Exberger, and Miss Fuller quoted softly, "'All you've got to do in the show business, they're all half crazy, is to nod your head and talk to them in a half whisper and say, "'Now this is just between you and I.' Exberger took it good-humouredly. "'I didn't make any exceptions in favour of myself,' he answered. But Mrs. Fields rescued him from further confusion by the announcement that the supper was ready. She had been told to call it dinner, but Stiles had known at the time that she would be adamant. He submitted to the inevitable, and well he might, for although a supper, in name, was a dinner in fact, the paper, however, was still uppermost, and Stiles seized the event of the soup to ask, in a rather stern manner, Mr. Field, Mrs. Fields, where did you find this paper? The moment was meant to be impressive, a strong will dominating a weak one, but Mrs. Fields again failed to understand the part which was expected of her. She took the paper, made a motion of tapping over her sunken chest, and answered, "'I can't read it without my spectacles.' Stiles tried what lawyers call refreshing the memory of the witness. "'Mr. Exberger says he found it beside his bed,' he shouted suggestively. Mrs. Fields's expression became one of complete understanding. "'Oh,' she replied, with evident relief, "'then that's where I dropped it. I was saving that paper to give it to Judge Tyler.' "'Judge Tyler?' asked Stiles, and in such a tone that he did not need to repeat. It did not upset Mrs. Fields. When her master was angry and excited, she merely thought that he had a nice speaking voice. "'Yes,' she nodded in reply to the question. "'Judge Tyler told me to find all the papers with old-fashioned writing and bring them to him.' Tense would have been a good word to describe the atmosphere of the table at that announcement. Alone, Mrs. Fields stood lax and dreamy, her hands rolled in her apron. Stiles broke the long and significant silence. "'When did the judge tell you that?' "'Before you came, when he was here to wind up the settlement.' A detail of far greater moment came into her mind. He counted all the towels and all the sheets and put them down in a book. Oh, answered Stiles, and the strained air of the table relaxed. Mrs. Field stood ready to answer any and all further questions, but it was only as an afterthought that Stiles thought of one. He was about to propose to propound it when Exberger stopped him. With the brusque air of one who says, Here, let me tend to this woman, he held up his hand and turned to Mrs. Fields. Did Judge, what's his name? Tyler, supplied Stiles. Did Judge Tyler take away any old papers? But Exberger had not yet caught the knack of talking to Mrs. Fields. How's that? she asked. Exberger repeated. His eye was bright and his manner absorbed, for his failure of the afternoon had only succeeded in, make, in making him an antiquarian for life. Henceforth, he was to be at his best among the yees and yats. He put his lungs into the question. Did Judge Tyler take away any old papers? Mrs. Fields smiled dryly. Scads of em, almost a barrel. 
Pecksberger allowed his head to move cautiously until he caught Stiles' eye, and the two men looked at each other significantly. Suddenly, Stiles had an inspiration. Taking from the table his own Charlotte, his own Chattertonian forgery, he handed it to Mrs. Fields. Here, he bellowed casually, you might as well give him this. Exberger looked at him in applause, and Miss Fuller beamed. It was a master stroke, the hit of the day. One saw the villain of Way Down East digging by lantern light to find the treasure of Nicholas Crater. One saw also the price of the farm going up. Mrs. Fields took the manuscript without marked elation, but Stiles was beginning to understand this dark mind. The housekeeper turned to leave, but Exberger was the real hawkshaw of the party. Did the judge, he asked sharply, offer you any money to bring the old papers to him? The housekeeper turned and looked at him blankly, and all three of them there at the table hung anxiously on the reply. A great deal ex a great deal expended on the a great deal depended on the words of that old woman. She seemed to get it at law last, and threw up her head scornfully. Money him Chapter eight Do you know what I should like to do? said Stiles, as Exberger, Miss Fuller, and he strolled out from dinner into the cool fragrance of the summer evening. Mrs. Fields, as a witness, might be infantile, but as a cook she was epic, and the atmosphere of the moment was one of majestic content. Exberger, uh, one presumes, had already made the remark that country life was the only life, after all, that he wanted, uh, that he wondered why anyone lived in the city, and that, just as soon as he got his affairs in shape, he was going to buy a farm. To this, Miss Fuller, supposedly, had answered with a cynical silence. She had a way of being cynical silently, for Exberger had been heard to remark, "'You don't believe it, Rose, but I'm going to surprise you all one of these days.' <laughs> "'Do you know what I should like to do?' said Stiles. "'I should like to go down and see that old codger and find just what he has got, just what he is up to.' "'By George, we'll do it!' Exberger caught the spirit. You send for a car. Telephone right away. Oh, damn. We might walk, suggested Stiles. It is only two miles. We'll walk it then, said Exberger. Of course he'll deny that he has any papers, but between us I guess that we can make the old skeezix squirm. Then suddenly he paused and put his hands on his hips. Say, he said, do you know what we're doing? We're actually getting to believe this bunk. Stiles hardly smiled. That's what I told you. That is just what happened to me. I've got so I'm looking for footprints under the windows and expecting to have bullets just graze my ear. I told you that I expected someone to go through my desk. And they have, too, he added. If you count Fieldsy. <laughs> Exberger stood shaking his head. Well, anyway, what's the harm? He burst out with a dubious smile. Are you on? I'm on, replied Stiles, and apparently, as an afterthought, Exberger turned to Miss Fuller. How about it, Rose? Mercy, exclaimed Miss Fuller, has it come to that? What do you mean, has it come to that? asked Exberger. Nothing, replied Miss Fuller demurely. Exberger flushed just a little and walked ahead, but Stiles had caught the girl's eye behind the other man's back. He smiled faintly, but she smiled broadly. She had no intention of keeping Exberger a secret from the world. At the gate, Exberger turned and waited for the others. I wonder if he'll try to lie out of it, he speculated. In Stiles flashed up some unsuspected spark of sectional pride. I don't think so, he replied. The Pilgrim Fathers have left behind their full quota of crabs, but very few downright liars. It was still wavering daylight when the judge's house came in sight. The judge himself was spraying a hose on his flower bed. With his ambassadorial whiskers and with the background of his old-fashioned garden, he formed a picture which made Miss Fuller exclaim, What a darling old man! Darling is good, commented Stiles. Good evening, judge, he said in a louder tone. The judge looked up sharply. Good evening, he said. He threw the hose, sputtering and writhing, on the grass, and came forward with an air which was not ungenial. 
Mr. Styles, he said, they tell me you sold your place. No, replied Styles, I haven't sold it. The judge looked at him a moment, then tossed his head. Well, he confessed, I mistrusted there weren't anything to it. They was telling me something about your getting twenty thousand dollars in one express, express package from this Exberger. Styles smiled. This is Mr. Exberger, he replied. He can tell you whether I did or not. The judge got his first good look at the tall young man. "'Are you Mr. Exberger?' he asked in amazement. Exberger nodded, and the judge at least was frank. "'I heard considerable about you,' he said. "'But I thought you was a Jewish feller.' All three of his visitors laughed. "'I guess you never saw a red-headed Jew before,' suggested Exberger. The judge thought a moment before committing himself. "'No,' he confessed. "'I don't believe that I have.' The judge leaned down, turned off the hose, and deliberately wiped his hands on the grass. "'I was coming up to see you this morning,' he said to Stiles. "'I wanted to ask you about that paper.' Behind him, Stiles could feel Miss Fuller's sinister merriment, although he knew instinctively that her expression had not changed an atom. Even Experger seemed to have a twinkle of amusement. "'Miss Fields give it to that Jenkins boy when he went by with the milk for the Boston train,' explained the judge, "'and he give it to my Harry up to the store. Come in,' he continued hospitably. "'Come in, ma'am.' The hall into which they followed him was dim and musty, and, as they entered, a thin elderly woman with a guilty air snatched something in cloth and slipped out of sight. The judge pried open the door of the parlour, and, in the open doorway of a room beyond, another thin, elderly woman with a guilty air snatched something in cloth and slipped out of sight. The judge, of course, was as unconscious of them as he was of the smell of cabbage. "'I'll get a light,' he said, and he left his three guests in the darkening room, not so much seeing it as sensing it, the small paned windows, the white wood panels, the feel of plated rag rugs underfoot and the chill that never leaves such rooms even in summer. Stiles wondered whether Exberger or Miss Fuller had ever seen such a room. He could make out their outlines in the dusk, standing, staring, not in the least amused, rather timidly, like children sent with a note to the minister and waiting for the answer. In a Broadway restaurant, Exberger would have been a man to look at twice, to wonder who he was and then ask the waiter, in the big foreign car with the veils from in the big foreign car with veils from her hat, Miss Fuller was the last note in languid sophistication. Yet, here in this musty provincial parlour, they both looked suddenly crude, almost coarse-lined. Styles wondered. There must be something in the Ten Commandments and Plymouth Rock, and all, after all. The judge came back with a parlour lamp, an atrocious thing with a painted globe, which he put on the table, bending to its level, and squinting his eyes as he turned it up. It brought out the shape of a huge gilt mirror and a crayon portrait of a woman with an agate brooch and hair parted over her temples. The judge took from his pocket Stiles's antique. "'Just what was it you wanted me to do with this?' he asked. "'Sit down, ma'am, sit down.' Stiles looked shamefaced at Exberger and then at Miss Fuller, but his fellow children were unable to help him, and he saw that he must lie alone. "'I wondered just what you would make of it,' he said, weakly. "'It looks like it looks like an antique document,' suggested Exberger, helpfully. Humph said the judge. He studied the paper he held in his hand, then balanced a pair of steel-rimmed glasses on his nose. "'Where did you get this?' he asked. Exberger and Miss Fuller looked eagerly at Stiles. They were expecting great things of him, but Stiles also felt that they were both slowly turning against him, that they were both becoming distinctly amused, not to say ribald, at his expense. "'Why, it was lying around my house,' he said lamely. This, at least, was literally true. The judge studied the paper further, and with growing scorn. "'Sounds like the Bible,' he said, "'but it ain't.' Then suddenly, wholly un unconscious of his own sarcasm, he added, would you like to see some real old papers? It was Miss Fuller who answered. 
One couldn't understand why, but one felt unconsciously that she was the only one who was really in much favor with the judge. "'Oh, yes. Can we?' she asked. Without a word, but rather snuffling his nose, the judge shuffled out of the room. The three sat in silence, which Exberger summed up in one word. "'Stung!' The judge came back with a small packet of folded papers done up with a bit of red tape, papers worn and spotted and heavy and brown, to the color of gingerbread. He did not even need to set them down on the table to make the pitiful forgery of Styles' look in comparison as a modern chair might look in an old museum. Exberger's eyes danced. Whatever might be the limitations of this man, he knew the real thing when he saw it. The judge cleared his throat with a disagreeable and unconscious thoroughness and untied the red tape. He took the first crumbling document from the top and rubbed it between his fingers. "'Feel that, and then feel this,' he said, picking up the apocryphal manuscript from the table. All three of them did it obediently, and all three exclaimed respectfully, as people are expected to do on such occasions. "'That's nothing but a letter wrote by Miss Tyler's grandfather when he was in London in 1806. The judge discarded carelessly several minor papers from the packet and picked out the one he wanted. This was the heaviest and the largest oh, this was the heaviest and the largest of the lot, written on parchment. This is a commission from Governor Shirley of Massachusetts for my grandfather's uncle in the French and Indian War. He was part of England then. He was massacred at Fort William, or Fort Henry, I disremember which. Massacred, repeated expert rigor artlessly. Who by? The French or the Indians, one way or the other, answered the judge nonchalantly. He was absorbed in looking for another paper, and at last he found it. Here, this is what I was looking for, he said. That thing of yourn claimed to be wrote in 1791. I hain't any of precisely that date, but this one was wrote in 1786, and they wrote just the same then. This was a deed for some land up Spicer way. He handed out the decreased and yellow document, and Exberger, the antiquarian, was the one who took it. "'You see them S's?' asked the judge. "'That's what I wanted to show you.' You see them S's in that deed? Some of them's wrote like F's, but they ain't F's, they're S's. Now you look at that paper you sent, and you'll see that all the S's are wrote just like we write now. The minute I see that paper, I says, That was wrote since I went to school. But the antiquarian in Exberger had already begun to feel his oats. The thrill was on him. But look here, he exclaimed, completely absorbed in the real antique. Here's an S. By these presents. The judge looked over his glasses at the word to which Exberger's finger was pointing. That's what I was telling you, he said testily. It was one. It was only when the S come at the end of a word, or when two S's come together. Then they wrote the second S like we do now. There was a fellow brought me a paper into the mason's lodge one night that he claimed was three hundred years old. It was something about the Catholics. I ain't no Catholic, but the minute I clap my eyes on it, I says, that paper ain't no three hundred years old. You know why? Why? asked Miss Fuller, nor did she add, Mr. Bones. Why? repeated the judge, because that paper had all the S's written like F's. And sure enough, that paper was wrote in Philadelphia by a bad priest or somebody. There was thousands of copies all over the country. There was quite some talk about it at the time. Around here, that wouldn't have fooled nobody. When I was a boy, half the old people in this town was still right in that way. But this happened in California. In California? exclaimed Stiles. Have you lived in California? No, I never lived there, replied the judge, as if offended that he had been asked. I was just there, in forty-nine. A forty-niner, suggested Stiles, with sudden interest. The judge did not take his eyes from the paper in his hands. No, he replied absently. I want no forty-niner. I was in the navy. His three visitors looked at one another, and then looked at the judge. 
By silent consent, Stiles seemed elected to speak. Were there many boys from this uh, inland county, inland country in the navy in those days? He asked tactfully. The judge put down the paper, picked up the bundle of the other papers, and began running through them. No, he said, if that matter did not interest him. I never heard of any except me. I wouldn't have been in the navy myself if I hadn't been shipwrecked. Exberger could stand it no longer. You were shipwrecked? Shipwrecked? Where? The judge shook his head impatiently and began running through the papers again. Hark, he commanded, irritated. You made me lose my place. Here it is. He took a paper from the packet and then replied calmly. Where did you say? Oh, on the Malay Peninsula. Not a great way from Singapore. Having found the paper, he seemed to allow himself some interest in the conversation. His eyes almost twinkled at some dead recollection, stimulated, and he volunteered of his own accord. But that was a long time ago. My father thought I had better go round the world. He didn't want me. He didn't want to see much of me just then. Miss Fuller, obviously, was the only one who could ask the delicate question after that. What had you done so terrible? The judge laughed. He really did like Miss Fuller. Oh, it wouldn't seem so terrible now, but he was a very strict man. You see, I've been thrown out of Harvard College. You just wait a minute, added the judge hastily, and he shuffled out of the room. I thought I had what I wanted here, but it want the one. The three left behind looked at one another. Say, do you get it? whispered Exberger at last. And here us boobs come down here to stream the old chap. I wonder if he was ever in the show business. Let's ask him, suggested Miss Fuller. Holy smoke, replied Exberger. If we asked him that, we'd probably find that he was the first little Eva. But Stiles was the philosopher of the party. He sat silent for a long time, and then he said, Do you suppose it would do that to everybody? What do what? asked Exberger. Living in the country, replied Stiles. Think of it. First fired out of Harvard, shipwrecked at Singapore, in California in 49. And now, look at him. I think he's an old darling, returned Miss Fuller, loyally. Oh, sure, agreed Exberger. But I get what you mean, Stiles. I was wondering that, too. Shh, here he comes. The judge came shuffling back into the room. I couldn't find it, he said, but twan't of much account. Exberger had a sudden possession of mischief. Judge, he asked, holding up the forgery which had occasioned this evening of reminiscence, what do you think that this really is? To their surprise, the judge was not contemptuous, merely pitying. Well, he said slowly, some fool wrote that, thinking he was smart. You see, there has been a lot of nonsense about that old house of yours, Mr. Stiles. Always has been ever since I can recollect. In fact, I suppose it has been that way ever since the murder. The murder? exclaimed Miss Fuller and Stiles in chorus. Well, replied the judge, deprecatingly, leastways that was what it was called. He smiled and went through the motions of chuckling, although he did not make a sound. I suppose, he said, that no one took the trouble to tell you that that house of yours was haunted. And I think that is an excellent place to stop for tonight. <laughs> it being late and me having even more drudgery of work on the morrow. Huh. I'm really enjoying this book. <laughs> you know, interesting characters, but plenty of comedy. And now we're finally getting to the mystery, which appears not to have just been much ado about nothing after all. The book delights in going back and forth on such a point. Mm. Well, I'm definitely getting into it more and more. I don't know why, it wasn't, why this one isn't better known. I don't know that it had been reprinted since, I don't know, 20s, 30s, until they reprinted it on, I think, some print-by-demand service of public domain books on Amazon of late. Hmm. And hey, Yak Man, I don't know if you're still here, but <laughs> yeah. Happy to 
regale you with story time. Reckon as we should wrap up, find somebody to raid, and we'll climb into bed. I must have my dinner, well, the rest of it. As for what's coming up on stream, hmm. this week's a bit of an odd one, because I got invited to an event on Wednesday night, so not quite such a masochist that I'm going to try and stream and then head out to it at midnight. So I think I'm going to stream either tomorrow or Thursday instead of Wednesday, and I'm leaning towards tomorrow. I'll just have Thursday to relax before whatever madness the end of the week throws at me. So we'll be streaming more of Doom 3, Resurrection of Evil, tomorrow, or possibly Thursday, but likely tomorrow. Then Saturday, I intend to finish up the Haunted PS1 Demo Disc 2021, and Sunday, we'll finish Carol Reed, Carol Reed number 2, Hope Springs Eternal, and start a new game. I'm leaning toward Ghosts of Mystery Manor, but maybe I'll pull out something else. God knows there are enough games that I keep meaning to try and get working, and then not succeeding at. Well, only a couple I keep coming back to. And most of them probably not worth it. Let's find someone to rage, shall we? Uh, hmm. Let's see. Hmm. Oh, wait, is Seraphine still? Man, yeah. Seraphine's had returned from his streaming hiatus, but alas, he's gone offline. <laughs> um, snake rattle and roll. Sounds like a TV show about a robot whose head is a snake instead of a videotape. I'd watch it. Soon it has Hanna Barbera cartoons. Um, how about we raid? Yeah, our friend Yaden doesn't have many viewers. And he's playing Snake Rattle and Roll on the NES. He's a professional wrestler and retro streamer. Let's go over and say hi to him. Huh, looks a bit Qbertish. Should I try and find somebody who's doing audiobook? On the off chance I found them, they've likely disabled raids, too. There. there we go. Seems to be functioning. Hmm. And once again, thank you, everybody, for coming to hang out. All of you chatters, and all of you lurkers, and... All of you lovers of literature, or at least weird old obscure books. You guys can find me on Twitter and MySpace, where I post stream announcements and random thoughts and jokes. And you can find VODs, my past streams, up on YouTube. And you can also find me on Pinterest and Tumblr and Instagram. Wait, no you can't, because I'm not on those sites. That would be ridiculous. And I had too many sights. <laughs> oh, hey, good night, Stock for Water. Thanks for hanging out. So, hope you all sleep well. 
And if you run into any antique papers, I hope that they're not forgeries, or if they are, at least entertaining. Say hi to Mercury Aiden, and I'll see you chaps probably tomorrow for some demon shooting fun in 3D.